Welcome to segment two of Citizens Forum being filmed on August 21st in the beautiful Memorial Arena just off downtown Victoria. I'd like to thank our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that make it all happen. Uh, our guest in this segment is Leslie McGarry. Leslie is with the Victoria Native Friendship Center mm -hmm. and I heard you speak I guess a few weeks ago and I thought that what you were saying was so interesting um, that I wanted to ask you to be on the show. And what struck me is that you were talking about Native communities going back hundreds of years, really, mm -hmm. and it just seemed that you were talking about a way of doing things that made a lot more sense than the way we're doing things now. Mm -hmm. And I think if we don't change, uh, only disaster awaits us. And it's already too late, but still we've got to change. And I just thought that the kinds of things you were talking about mm -hmm. were there. So we, you, we wanted to talk about indigenous culture in relation to the environment. Mm -hmm. So away we go. Okay. <laughs> um, for, I think first of all, uh, the First Nations people, I think across Canada have the same concept or same idea that the earth doesn't belong to us, we belong to the earth. And I think that's where sometimes we go south with mainstream societies. We have a different perspective entirely on why we're here. And so for, for all of the different First Nations that you will visit across Canada, they will have the same idea that we are caretakers or we are here to coexist with the earth, not impose on the earth. And, and along with that, one of the things that we share across the country is governance by the seasons. The seasons tell us when it's time to do certain things. So that's one of the common threads that we share right across this country and our approach to our environments, no matter what they are. You might live in the Arctic, subarctic, uh, the coastal plateau, prairie regions. The idea is basically the same. So, I mean, to me, that makes a lot of sense. And maybe you can just repeat it. We're, we're not here to dominate the earth. We... We're here to coexist. And for the First Nations people, the, there's always a consideration for the other things, living things around us. And on that note, um, according to the seasons, there are times when we hunt, times when we fish, times when we gather, times when we educate, times for ceremony. And we utilize the environment to tell us when it's time to do those certain things. For example, um, even astronomy, the, 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 where the stars are placed in the sky tells us when it's time to be gathering, when it's time to be uh, celebrating. All of those different things are indicated by the moon, the sun, the stars. So we have to be aware of that. We also have to take um, note of what the animals are doing. When the bear is hibernating, we are supposed to be hibernating. We're supposed to be in our big houses. This is when we are educating our children about who they are and where they come from. Um, the springtime is a season of renewal. This is when the earth is coming back to life. This is when we do all of our planning. For example, during the winter ceremonies, what special name are we going to give to this child? That'll all be planned in the springtime. When are we putting our canoes back in the water? And then the summertime is a season of family. This is when children would be involved in a lot of the uh, daily preparation, uh, whether it's harvesting food or, or harvesting uh, plants, children are included. Um, it's very important at this time of year for First Nations people to spend time with their children because fall is an action time. Children would not see their parents. They would spend fall with their elders because uh, parents are busy making sure there's going to be enough food for everybody through the winter. Have we stored enough uh, winter food? Have we prepared enough winter clothing? Uh, preparing everybody in the village for the winter to come. So everything was based on the, on a cycle of the seasons. I really like the way you said it right at the beginning, and I, maybe you can repeat it uh, mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. We're not here. We're here as part of the earth, not... Yes, we're here. We are. We don't own the earth. We are here because of the earth. We're here. Um, we don't. We don't own the land. The land is part of us. You know, um, it's this interconnectedness to the earth, to the environment, to the other creatures that live here. Um, for example, there are cultural protocols in place even when we're hunting animals. Even though, uh, for many First Nations peoples, the animals 
are part of our clan system. They, the animals have taught us certain lessons, things like that. That's part of our stories and legends. So when we hunt the animals, we have cultural protocols in place. For example, you can't go hunting until the ground is one color. This is uh, because when you go hunting, if you, you always want to go for a quick kill, but if you happen to wound an animal, it's a lot easier to track if the ground is one color. So these are cultural protocols that are in place to this day uh, where people won't go hunting until, for example, the, the uh, sun has burned the grass brown. Now the ground, that'll be the end of this month, early September. The next time will be after the first snowfall. This is when we go into the forest. The other thing, the other cultural protocol we keep in mind is that we don't go into the forest when there are babies. You don't want to take children away from their parents. You don't want to take parents away from their children. So you don't even go into the forest to harvest medicine when there are births in the forest. And these are things you need to adhere to in order to not interfere with the cycle of life. And that's the whole point, is to be coexisting with the environment, not against it, or harvesting, resourcing it to absolute limits. That's not part of our teachings. So, I mean, to me, our society, and especially our economy, is just taking us in completely wrong directions, mm -hmm. as if the Earth doesn't really exist except for being something that we can take as much as we can from mm -hmm. and there's no end to it. Mm -hmm. Is native, can native wisdom take us in a different direction? Well, I think um there are people in mainstream society like David Suzuki who have been saying the same message over and over again. You know, you have to be aware of the, the environment, you have to look after the earth. All of those messages are out there. It's just that there's not enough people listening to it because we're driven by the wrong values. It all, to me, it always comes down to money. Everything involves money. And in the communities, First Nations communities 200 years ago, everybody relied on everybody else. So if I was the weaver for my village, I wasn't weaving just for my family. I was weaving mats and blankets for everybody in the village. Same with the fishermen. You shared your particular skill or gift with the rest of the people in your village. It wasn't yours exclusively. Um, and that sort of mindset has shifted um, in this day and age, which makes it very difficult to influence change when people are I mean, in, in reality, we all have to survive. We all have to have a job. We all have to make you know, enough money to survive. And it's a shame that we don't incorporate, in a lot of instances, those old teachings about looking after each other, basically, and, and knowing that there isn't an unlimited supply of deer or elk or fish or anything, any of the other natural resources around us. We tend to think that it's just going to go on forever and ever. Logging is a clear indication of that. Yeah, logging. The logging is, and the fishing industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what we've done is is disastrous. It mm -hmm. has been for, you know, at the behest of the few who who run the show, mm -hmm. um, and we just have to do better. Mm -hmm. We have to, and we have to turn around and start to fix things up. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the, I guess, the communitarian uh, culture? and the idea of sharing. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that we're taught when we're very young to, um, to always be giving. Um, I think our former Lieutenant Governor put it very well, uh, Stephen Point said, we should always be in a process where we were constantly filling our basket and then emptying our basket to the benefit of the community. Filling and emptying, that's what we're supposed to be doing. What we tend to do, unfortunately, is hoard so that we have the most of everything and then we can start to influence the way we think things should go this way or that way. But in the Aboriginal community, it's constant sharing. You don't, um, you don't keep taking. Um, you have to give back to your community. You're always, um, nobody is, is above anybody else. It's everybody all together. Even the chiefs in the community have a very special role to play. When you become a chief, you become a servant to, to your people for the rest of your life. So this isn't a big position um, you know, that has all this power and high rank. It has more to do with being there for your people than anything else. 
And um, I think our two uh, local chiefs here in Victoria do a tremendous job of, of demonstrating that. They are constantly there for their people. I know that Chief Andrew Thomas, his people are his priority and he will put them above anything else that happens to be happening in the city or the capital or the or province. His people are his main fo focus and he demonstrates that daily. So the two chiefs locally here mm -hmm. are Andrew Thomas. Uh, Andrew Thomas is the chief of the Esquimalt Nation and Ron Sam is the uh, current chief of the Songhees people. Um, prior to Ron Sam's position it was Robert Sam that was the, uh, the chief of that territory. And I think um, all of the chiefs, uh, even the, the chiefs out in uh, Saanich, out in Souk, are all um, trying to put their best foot forward on behalf of their people all the time. And it's not just around the environment, it's around the economy, it's around housing, it's around health, it's around all kinds of different issues. Are, are the chiefs um, hereditary or elected? There are both. Okay. There are hereditary chiefs. Uh, this is passed down through a family. And there are elected chiefs who look after a lot of more of the administrative side of things uh, on reserve. Do the two work together in or are there two completely different ways of doing things? The, I think most of them try to work together, but there are different, there, there are different views because one position um, deals with more the contemporary reality for First Nations people and the other sort of the historic uh, okay. references. Um, one is traditional, one is not so traditional. And so I, I think that sometimes it can be at cross purposes. But I think the teachings that come from their territories are what bind them together. So they will spend uh, quite a bit of time actually trying to come to common ground on, on whatever the issue on the table is. So it can be difficult when you, when you have come from two different worlds. I was asked recently why there aren't more First Nations people involved in politics. Why don't they step up you know, on a platform of Aboriginal rights or something? And it's like, because you were asking that individual to step out of their values, the values that they've grown up with, that their elders have passed down to them or their families. And there's, it's so contradictory to what you grow up with and now you've got to step out of those shoes and into this other setting that is qu quite often very, very difficult. And um, uh, because there are so few First Nations people, it makes it even more difficult. And because also cultural diversity across the country. You know, the people in Atlantic Canada had contact in the 1600s uh, on this, on the west side of Canada, western side of Canada, we didn't have substantial contact and settlement until the 1800s. So there's 200 years of difference in contact, which is very substantial when it comes to um, Aboriginal leadership and, and bringing that Abri traditional Abri Aboriginal leadership to a more contemporary setting. So there's lots of challenges and barriers in place there for that to actually happen. When, when I heard you speak, you talked a little bit about the potlatch. Mm -hmm and I don't really know anything <coughs> about it. The only thing I really know about it was that it was banned, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know when, a uh, hundred and some odd years ago, I guess, or, mm -hmm. or what, can you just, what, what was the potlatch and what is it about? Um, th well, the word potlatch actually comes from the Nuchanath language from the west coast of Vancouver Island, and it means to give or giving. And it's a general, a word that's a general description of the events that uh, Chief uh, will host when he is naming grandchildren, when he's raising a new pole, when somebody's getting married, when somebody has passed away. These are all reasons for the chief to potlatch. And it's his way of sharing these special occasions with his people. Um, up until fairly recently, the people on the coast here did not have a written language. So having these gatherings was the only way to pass down cultural information and significant events to the community. So the chief would host a potlatch. He would also demonstrate uh, his wealth, his position in the community, reestablish that or reaffirm it with his people. Um, he would pass down rights to uh, future generations. All of these things would happen at a potlatch. And the reason why it's called potlatch is because at the conclusion of the gathering, he gives all of his guests a gift. This gift is payment for witnessing these ceremonies. And as you receive the gift, you make a promise, an unspoken promise, to. Uh, remember this information, bring it back to your village or pass it down through your family. And that's how the culture survived along the coast here for thousands of years. So it's a very, very critical part of our culture and it was actually banned in 1884 and not, uh, the ban wasn't lifted until 1951. So would a chief be able to have the wealth to host such a 
Mm -hmm. With his extended family, usually you would spend years preparing. For example, if a chief passes away, his family will spend years preparing to make sure that all the right acknowledgements are in place, all the appropriate dance regalia that's going to be required has been prepared. There's so much planning that happens even today uh, to prepare for a potlatch. So it's, it's an enormous event. It's In traditional communities, mm -hmm. Was everybody um, kind of a, a similar level of income or wealth, or were there great disparities, or do you have any way of knowing? I think in some cultures there was an equal distribution of, of wealth, in others there was um, situations where a high-ranking family, a chief, might have more wealth than others, but there was always a responsibility, an unspoken responsibility to look after those who don't have enough. Um, and that's still a standing uh, thing today, that looking after the people who, are, who don't have so much and that we need to w look out for them and, and lift them up and help them where we can. Can you talk a little bit about maybe medicines? Mm -hmm. Because um, I'm interested in herbal medicine myself mm -hmm. and there must have been a very um, well-developed set of medicines with native communities. Absolutely, there are um, all kinds of healing herbs available in the, the, on the coast and the interior of British Columbia. Um, aspirin was discovered by First Nations people well before Euro European people understood what that was used for. Uh, all kinds of different remedies are available through traditional medicine and there are people who are designated with that particular, no they have that particular knowledge and have demonstrated interest in that from a very young age and that interest has been nurtured. So we have some very um, well-versed people in, med in traditional medicine within the communities. Um, some of the different things would be uh, Devil's uh, Club, um, uh, willow, the bark of the willow tree, um, uh, stinging nettle tea, all kinds of different uh, remedies for um, arthritis, for uh, uh, colds and flu, all of that ex is all available in the forest around us. Yeah. I have a feeling it's a very effective medicine system. Mm -hmm. It is, um, because the approach to medicine is very holistic. If you go to a medicine person and you say, uh, I have a bad cold, the first question they're going to ask you is, what's making you anxious in your life? Because you're not sleeping properly, you're not eating properly, and you've basically invited illness into your body, so what's happening for you? And through the course of your discussion, you might share that maybe you're a student and ex it's exam time is coming and you're not really confident in your knowledge. So now that they know that, they know which animals to call on in the animal spirit to maybe guide you. Um, in our cultures, sky animals represent leadership and knowledge. Land animals are workers, workers and protectors. Sea animals represent wealth and prosperity. And creepers and crawlers like snakes and frogs are healers. So we call on those animals occasionally to sort of be a guide. And then once we look after the big picture, then you are prescribed for something for the illness that you have. And you usually carry that around your neck in a little pouch so you remember to take your medicine. And I think that's something we should be doing today. <laughs> Leslie, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for doing this. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.